I've taken several trainings with, with Dante when he used to work for the city and he used to say, it's going to get deep. So before I bring him out to the stage, I just wanted to give a little brief introduction. Dante King is a native of San Francisco, California. He is an author of the new book, The 400 Year Holocaust. And he is also a professor of American history, African American history and black studies. His research interests include the intersections of race, racism, and legality throughout pre- and post-colonial America, and King currently serves as guest faculty at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, as well as the Mayo Clinic, or Mayo Clinic. So please join me in welcoming Dante King. I also want to recognize the uh, San Francisco Public Library staff and the videographers who are here, the, the AV uh, team. And last but not least, and I have a slide here, I'll come back to that, but my dear, sweet, beautiful mother, um, who is my best friend. She is responsible for me being able to breathe life every day, and she um, has nurtured me, her commitment to nurturing me and providing love and care and sensitivity throughout all of my, my life. There are just not enough words. We're gonna talk about the evolution and normalcy of white supremacy and anti-blackness in academic, scientific, and medical philosophy. Education in America um, is just another institution to indoctrinate people to serve the interests of white people. You got that? So let me translate this to you, what he was saying. The reason why whites in the North are more intelligent than whites in the South is because in the South, there are more Negroes. And so just being in, in proximity to black people makes you less intelligent. You've been recently awarded the prestigious position of assistant professor of medical education at the Mayo Clinic School of Medicine. What would you recommend to others who understand the importance of critical race theory? What do you recommend they do to promote the inclusion of theories such as critical race theory into educational settings? It's toxic at its roots, and so I think that people need to, we don't have to in include necessarily critical race theory or CRT in the way that it is alluded to or the way that it is framed. What we do need to include, though, is an examination of um, colonial level and state level laws that serve to establish that black men could be castrated, that served that black people um, could be murdered. These laws read over and over and over and over and over again. If a black person get out of line, gets out of line, essentially a white person has the right to correct them and murder them. And if they, they end up murdering them, then there won't be, there, there, there would not necessarily be any consequences. I teach a course at UCSF it's called Understanding the Roots of Racism and Bias, Anti-Blackness, and Its Links to Whiteness, White Racism, Privilege, and Power. And I had a doctor tell me, he attended the course. He said, when I was at Duke University between 1970 and 1974, I worked with the Eugenical, steri uh, uh, the Eugenical um, Sterilization Board um, as, as a, um, I was a resident and I had doctors and, and we worked together to go around and locate 16-year-old black virgins and give them hysterectomies. Because it was per there was legal precedent. There was academic scientific precedent to be able to do it. These theories are used to uh, establish, these are the uh, people who developed IQ theory Intel it. So whenever we're talking about IQ, my IQ is high, it's this, is that. It's all according to white standards, white psychological, diabolical, sociopathic standards that serve to do nothing but relegate black people and non-white people into the bottom of this society. This is 1910 from a mayor in Baltimore. 
He says Blacks should be quarantined in isolated slums in order to reduce the incidence of civil disturbance and to prevent the spread of communicable disease into the nearby white neighborhoods and to protect property values among the white majority. How many of you understand that you can never make it out of this type of situation if you are the person or the group of people who are being targeted? If sex work was legal, when white men were in control of it, why can't black women benefit from it? Loudness is not, there's not a problem with loudness at its core if Tim and Bobby and his, his friends that he plays video games with are being loud. It may, it may not even be a problem if white women or Mexican women are being loud, but black women? There's an anti-black sentiment. Or oh, you laugh loud. I said, wow, now it's the laugh. Right? Next is the hair, the cheekbones. It's, it's unfavorable. You can be doing the same thing that others are doing, and it's just seen differently on you. That is a sickness. It is not you that, it, that is inferior. It is not you that has something wrong with you. It is the context that you're in that is destructive, that is not meant for your good. It is meant for your destruction. And so you need to, to validate yourself, all of your family members. There's not one condition that has been arranged or set up in this society that black people are responsible for. Not one. Not Pookie going to jail because he robbed the bank or Quita prostituting herself. Most of the affluent upper middle class, middle class communities where white people live in this country are segregated. So it's okay if they have their communities, we're not welcomed into it, but it's problematic when black people do it and that represents the core of what I am discussing in my book around anti-blackness. The threats that I received when I put this book out and people wanting to come after me, I'm more concerned about that, you know? And if someone does decide to um, attack me violently or if I end up, you know, dead, which I don't want that to happen, I'll knock on wood. But it happens to people who come, who it happens to people. It happened to Medgar Evers, it happened to Martin Luther King, it ha happened to Malcolm X, it happens to anyone who chooses to um, fervently and, and commercially uh, disagree with this cultural environment and anyone who espouses an opinion that does not favor or align with the masses. And I just can't be concerned about that because it would, that's nowhere in my purpose at all whatsoever. In America, all of America's economies, starting with the institution of slavery, have been uh, built with a common, or built upon a common foundation. And that common foundation is black suffering and pain. Black people, do you understand what I am trying to emphasize to you here today? There is an obsession that is predicated upon the way we look that allows for continued dehumanization. And we will never be able to escape it because white people in this country have trained everyone in the society to be sociopaths when it comes to black people. Hello, my name is Harold King. Uh, Dante King is my son. Uh, I'm very proud of what he's doing. He really enlightened a lot of people. I mean, he wrote a book. He told me he was writing a book. So. I said, okay, I know it's going to be a hell of a book. So he gave it to me, and uh, I've been reading it. It's sort of disturbing, some of it, but it's enlightening a lot of people. I'm glad he's doing this. I mean, he's helping people. Yeah. 
yeah. in general. I mean, the individuals that feel, well, they have the, hmm, the feeling of not being wanted, of not uh, having knowledge of where they are or their surroundings, really, and how people will treat you if you let them. It's all up to you how you feel about yourself. So I'm proud of my son. Thank God for him. He's been a blessing to me. Mm -hmm. I love him. I guess so. Uh,